All right, Deep Divers, welcome back. We've got a heavy one today, folks, uh, grappling with the aftermath of war. How do we pick up the pieces and how do we make sure that it never happens again? You guys sent in some really uh, fascinating stuff, articles, historical comparisons, some deep analysis. So let's dive right in with our expert. I'm really fascinated by events like those Israeli strikes on Iran. Scary as they are, they offer a glimpse into how global conflict is evolving. Right. It's not just about sending in the troops anymore. We're looking beyond those headlines to the bigger picture. It's kind of like uh, chess, right? Exactly. Each move has these ripple effects. And those strikes, for example, were strategic. They targeted specific military capabilities, a very different approach than, let's say, Napoleon's invasion of Russia. Oh, yeah. Napoleon's strategy was a tad bit less subtle. Scorched earth, burning down Moscow didn't really end well for him. Nope, not at all. It's a really stark example of how different approaches can have such different consequences, not just right away, but years, even decades later. So we've got shifting tactics, more nuanced strategies. Are we seeing this across the board? What else popped out at you from all the sources you've been going through? One theme that keeps popping up is the power of what I call normalcy. The idea that promoting everyday life, economic prosperity, even just living freely can counter militant ideologies, which is kind of surprising when you think about it. Wait, hold on. Normalcy undermines militancy. How does that work? Well, think about it this way. When people are invested in their jobs, families, enjoying their freedom, that allure of conflict or rigid ideology fades. They have something to lose. They have something to protect. They have something positive to focus on. So it's like if everyone's happy buying the latest gadgets or planning their vacation, they're less likely to sign up for a revolution or a war. That's the argument. And it contrasts sharply with societies that are always primed for war. Everything revolves around potential conflict. Take the Soviet Union before World War II, for example. Always on a war footing. Right. The Iron Curtain, the constant propaganda. Makes you wonder if those Cold War bomb shelters were really effective or just creating more anxiety. Exactly. Does true stability come from always prepping for the worst or from creating a society where people feel safe and prosperous, where they can focus on building a future? OK, that's a fascinating point. But even when a conflict seems successful, are we missing hidden costs like winning a battle but losing the war? Absolutely. We have to consider the unintended consequences, the ripple effects that go way beyond the battlefield. Think about the soldiers coming back from Ukraine or those being sent from North Korea to fight in Russia. Now, why would North Korea send soldiers to Russia? That seems pretty risky. It's complex, but likely tied to economics and political alliances. Whatever the reason, these people on both sides, they've seen the horrors of war firsthand. And if their societies aren't equipped to handle the psychological weight they carry. It could become really unstable. Mm. Like they come home traumatized, no support system. Exactly. They could become a destabilizing force even in their own countries. A stark reminder that the true cost of war goes beyond the battlefield and lasts long after the fighting stops. That's a heavy thought. Easy to get caught up in headlines and forget about that human cost, that lasting trauma. Speaking of the bigger picture, how do specific events, let's say the U.S. response to Chinese hacking, fit into all of this? That recent investigation into China's access to commercial telecommunications is a prime example of how countries are now vying for power in these subtle ways. It's not just about military force anymore. It's about information, technology, and economic influence. So less about tanks and missiles and more about who controls data, the networks, the flow of information, like a digital arms race. And just as risky. And it's all connected. You've got the situation with Hezbollah. Our sources say China's allegedly supporting them, complicating an already volatile Middle East, another wrench in global global stability. So we've got shifting tactics, the power of normalcy, unintended consequences, global power plays. That's a lot to take in. And the big question remains, if traditional military power isn't the answer, what is? Are models like NATO the way forward? Could that work globally? It's definitely a model to look at. NATO's ability to manage power on a global scale, even with its own issues, offers a blueprint. Could similar alliances actually succeed in places like the Middle East or Asia? They have vastly different histories and geopolitical situations. That's a tough one. Those regions feel like they're always on edge. Wouldn't it be incredibly hard to get that kind of unity and trust? You're absolutely right. Trust is essential. And that's where effective leadership comes in. We need leaders who can see beyond just their own national interests and who champion a vision of shared prosperity and security. Leaders who prioritize diplomacy and understand that true strength comes from working together, not dominating others. 
Okay, strong leadership is key. What else? We saw some hints in the source material about a Middle East NATO or an Asian NATO. Is that even remotely possible with all the baggage there? It's a bold idea for sure, and definitely not without its hurdles. But look at NATO in Europe. It's been successful despite internal disagreements and its changing role, so it's not impossible. So what needs to be in place for this to even have a chance? Because those regions feel like they're constantly about to explode. First, you need a shared dedication to peace and stability. All sides have to be willing to put diplomacy first, to prioritize compromise over conflict. And that takes trust and transparency, which can be tough in regions with such long histories of bad blood. Right, we can't ignore those historical grievances. It's like building a house on a foundation full of cracks. Exactly. It's not just about the military working together. It's about creating economic ties, promoting cultural exchange, and tackling the root causes of conflict. So it's about creating a more interconnected society where those divisions aren't so stark, so defining. Got it. But let's shift gears for a second. We talked about how nations are using power in new ways. You mentioned the U.S. response to Chinese hacking. It seems like information and technology are the new battlegrounds. Absolutely. It's a huge shift. In the past, a country's strength was measured by its military power. But now we're seeing economic clout, technological prowess, and control of information playing just as big, if not bigger, of a role. And sometimes it feels like those tactics are sneakier than traditional war like a slow poison eroding stability and trust. Absolutely right. Cyber warfare, for example, can cripple a country, mess up its economy, and sow chaos without a single shot fired. It's a whole new kind of battlefield where the lines between war and peace are blurred. It makes it so much harder to set rules and regulations. It's like the Wild West out there. And the stakes are huge. Control of information and technology equals immense economic and political power. We see it with the race for AI, 5G networks, and even controlling supply chains. Which brings us back to normalcy. Could that be the key? Not just for individuals, but as a global strategy. It's an interesting thought. What if every nation focused on a better future for its citizens, fostering innovation, cooperation, creating a stable and prosperous environment where people can thrive? Wouldn't that be a stronger deterrent than any military buildup? It would be a real game changer. But let's be real. We live in a world of greed, power grabs, and geopolitical maneuvering. You're right. It's not some naive utopia. But that doesn't mean we give up on a better world. And even small actions can have ripple effects. Okay, I like that. But give us something tangible. What can our listeners actually do to contribute to this uh, global shift in normalcy? Start by learning about global issues. Have respectful conversations with people from different backgrounds. Support groups that promote peace and understanding. And don't underestimate your voice. Contact your representatives. Support policies that put diplomacy and cooperation first and hold leaders accountable. So individual action leads to collective change. I'm with you there. But speaking of accountability, our source material went into some disturbing stuff about China's support for Hezbollah. They claimed that almost all the stuff for Hezbollah's terrorist activities comes from China, funded through oil smuggling. That's a serious accusation and one that needs more investigation. If it's true, it just shows how tangled the web of relationships is that leads to global instability. It highlights the need for more transparency and accountability. It's a reminder that achieving lasting peace means facing these tough truths and demanding better from our leaders. And it requires a team effort. No single country, no single group can solve these problems alone. It takes a global movement committed to peace, justice, and a shared future. But it starts with each of us making conscious choices in our own lives. You know, it's easy to feel overwhelmed by all of this. But like you said, even small actions matter. And hearing these stories of hope, of progress, even when things are tough, reminds us that we're not powerless. Exactly. We have more power than we think. And the more we embrace that, the more we help build a world where peace isn't just a dream, but a reality. Well, you know, Napoleon's invasion of Russia was a total disaster for him. But what's interesting is what happened when the Russian army, despite their losses, marched into Paris. Okay, so they're right in the heart of enemy territory. What happened? They got to see a level of structure, prosperity, everyday life that they couldn't have imagined. It was so different from the hardships and autocratic rule back home. It's like seeing the other side as real people, not just enemies. Exactly. And for some of those soldiers, it lit a fire. They wanted to change something better for their own country. It planted those seeds of progress even after all that destruction. That's powerful. It shows that even in the darkest times, there's potential for growth, for change. 
But how does that apply to us today? We're not talking about armies marching across continents. It's about realizing that true peace isn't just about treaties and ceasefires. It's about creating the right conditions for progress, understanding, a genuine desire for a better future. And sometimes that starts with seeing different ways of life, different values, different possibilities. You mentioned the power of normalcy before. Do you think that works on a personal level? Like, can our everyday choices make the world more peaceful? It's an interesting question. Imagine if we all focused on building lives based on peace, understanding, cooperation, even in our small everyday actions. Could that have a ripple effect? It's like a quiet resistance against the things that cause conflict. Choosing hope over fear, connection over division. I love that. But let's be real. How do we create those kinds of alliances, especially when there's not much trust? You're right. Trust is crucial. And that's where good leadership is so important. We need leaders who can think beyond their own interests and promote shared prosperity and security. Leaders who understand that working together is true strength, not domination. Okay, strong leadership is key. What else? Our sources mentioned a Middle East NATO or an Asian NATO. Is that even feasible with all the history there? It's a bold idea, no doubt, and it won't be easy. But look at NATO in Europe. It's worked despite disagreements and changes over time, so it's not totally out of the question. So what needs to happen to make this work? Because honestly, it feels like those regions are always on the brink of chaos. The most important thing is a shared commitment to peace and stability. Everyone involved has to put diplomacy first, compromise over conflict. That requires a level of trust and transparency that's really hard to build when there's a long history of animosity. Right. You can't just brush those historical grievances under the rug. Like I said before, it's like trying to build a house on a shaky foundation. Exactly. And it goes beyond just military cooperation. We need to create economic links, cultural exchange programs, and address the root causes of conflict, like social and political issues. So building a more interconnected society where those divisions aren't so deep, that makes sense. But let's talk about something else for a minute. We discussed how nations are using their power in new ways. You mentioned the U.S. response to Chinese hacking. It seems like information and technology are the new battlefields. Absolutely. It's a fascinating development. Military strength used to be the main measure of a country's power. But now, economic influence, technology, and controlling information are just as important, maybe even more so. And sometimes those tactics feel even more underhanded than traditional war, like a slow poison, weakening stability and trust. That's right. Take cyber warfare. It can cripple a nation's infrastructure, disrupt its economy, and cause chaos without firing a single shot. The line between war and peace is getting blurry. Makes it so much tougher to establish norms, create regulations like the Wild West of international relations. With incredibly high stakes. Control over information and technology means huge economic and political power. We're seeing this play out with AI, 5G networks, even control of vital supply chains. Which brings us back to that idea of normalcy. Could that be the solution, not just for individuals, but for the whole world? It's a thought-provoking idea. What if every nation focused on making life better for their people? promoting innovation and cooperation, building a stable, prosperous world where everyone can flourish, that would be a much stronger deterrent to conflict than any military buildup. It would totally change the way the world thinks. But let's be realistic here. We're dealing with greed, power grabs, and geopolitical maneuvering. You're not wrong. It's not some perfect utopia. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to create a better world. No. And even the smallest actions can have big consequences. Okay, I like that. But give us something concrete. What can people listening actually do to help create this global shift in normalcy? I like that phrase. Start by learning about global issues. Talk to people from different backgrounds with respect. Support organizations promoting peace and understanding. And remember, your voice matters. Reach out to your elected officials, support policies focused on diplomacy and cooperation, and hold those leaders accountable for their actions. So individual awareness and action can lead to real change. I can get behind that. But speaking of holding leaders accountable, our source material went pretty deep into some troubling details about China's support for Hezbollah. They claim that almost everything Hezbollah uses for its terrorist activities comes from China, paid for with smuggled oil money. That's a serious accusation, and it definitely needs more investigation. If true, it really highlights the complicated web of global relationships that lead to instability. It shows the need for more transparency and accountability in international relations. It reminds us that lasting peace means facing these tough truths and demanding better from our leaders. And it requires a collective effort. 
No single nation, no single organization can solve these problems alone. It takes a global movement of people dedicated to peace, justice, and a shared future. But it all begins with each of us making conscious choices in our own lives. You know, it's easy to feel overwhelmed by the enormity of it all. But as you said, even small actions can make a difference. And hearing these stories of hope, of progress, even in the face of such huge challenges, remind us that we're not powerless. Exactly. We have more power than we realize. And the more we use that power, the more we can create a world where peace isn't just a dream, but a reality. You know, talking about all this global stuff, it's easy to get bogged down in the negativity. But one thing that stuck with me from our sources was their take on the unintended consequences of war. They specifically talked about soldiers coming back from places like Ukraine or those sent by North Korea to Russia. Ah, uh, yes, the human cost. We can't forget about that. Exactly. They said these soldiers, after seeing the horrors of war, could actually become destabilizing back home, not because they're bad people, but because of the trauma. It's a sobering thought. War leaves scars, not just on the land, but on the minds of those who fight. And if we don't deal with the psychological impact on those soldiers, we risk more violence and instability. So just stopping the fighting isn't enough. We need to help them heal and help societies heal too. Absolutely. We need to rethink what peace really means. It's not just the absence of war. It's about well-being, justice, and opportunity for everyone. Creating a world where everyone feels safe, secure and valued, no matter who they are or what they believe, where they can focus on building a better future instead of just surviving. Which brings me back to this idea of a global shift in social consciousness. Our sources mention that too. Right. That's an interesting concept. Maybe humanity is going through a change just like individuals can change. We're more aware of how connected we are, how fragile our planet is, what our actions really mean. So we're waking up to a new reality. The old ways, all that conflict and competition, it's just not sustainable anymore. Exactly. And the shift is pushing us towards new ways of working together, sustainability, and global citizenship. It's a hopeful thought. It is. But our sources also said that some people might see this shift as a threat, especially those in power who rely on control and fear. Good point. If your power depends on keeping people divided, controlling information, always looking for an enemy, then a world where people want better lives connect with others across borders and demand freedom and transparency, well, that challenges your authority. So it's like a battle between those two forces, control versus freedom. I like that way of looking at it. And whoever wins that battle will shape the future. Wow, that's a lot of responsibility. <laughs> so what do we do? What can we do as individuals to help peace and freedom win? It's all about making choices in everything we do, supporting businesses and organizations that share our values being careful about what we read and hear, and calling out misinformation, talking to people who have different opinions with respect. Choosing hope instead of fear, connection instead of division. Hmm. Sounds easy, but I know it's not. You're right, it's not always easy. But it's so important, the more of us who make those choices, the more we shift things towards a peaceful and just world. Well, speaking of individual power, I think that's a good place to wrap up our deep dive. This has been a great conversation. Thank you for having me. And a big thank you to all of you deep divers out there for sharing such thought-provoking sources and for being here with us on this journey. We hope this has given you some new things to think about and inspired you to keep exploring these complex issues. Remember, peace is a journey, not a destination. And we all have a part to play in building a more just and compassionate future. Until next time, keep asking questions, keep exploring, and keep diving deep.